podcast. Are you a professional interviewer? <laughs> <laughs> Why do I feel like you should be the podcast host of Make People Beep? I should just quit my job now and the listeners be like, yeah, yeah, we don't want Lily on here anymore. Like bring Cass back for future episodes. <laughs> episode of Make Peace Not Beef is brought to you by CRISPR, Toronto's first and only zero-waste plant-based meal kit service. I know, finally! CRISPR delivers fresh ingredients and delicious recipes in reusable and returnable packaging. If you've always wanted to try a meal kit but haven't because of all the waste they create with single-use packaging, then CRISPR is the kit for you! Now let me tell you, I recently tried CRISPR for the very first time and oh my gosh, I am in love, like in love. I got the chili lime tofu satay salad and the spicy Korean cauliflower tacos and I swear to god the quality of food was restaurant grade or maybe I'm just a really great chef. And the best part, it's absolutely zero waste. Zero waste. There's a great variety of recipes to choose from every week. The food comes nicely packaged in reusable containers so nothing gets thrown in the garbage or even recycling. And they pick up your empty kit every week for you. Make Peace Not Beef listeners are getting a great deal. Just go to crisperkits.ca and enter the promo code MPMB20 when you check out for $20 off of your first week of meals. What a great deal. So make sure you jump on a Peacemaker and let me know how it tastes. Hello, fellow Peacemakers. Um, well, we have a bit of a different episode today, so you might notice my voice is a little bit different. I am not Lily. We are going to be interviewing Lily today. So, <laughs> hello, my name is Cassandra, and um, I'm one of the co-founders of workonclimate.org, and Lily interviewed me for her podcast um, a few months and episodes ago, and I was really struck during that interview that, like, Lily was asking so many good, insightful questions, and I really, really wanted to ask her some questions in return, but I felt like I would be distracting from so Lily's interview uh, by doing that. So after after the podcast, I asked Lily if I could interview her for her yeah. podcast. So um, here we are. And I'm imagining many viewers are probably excited and curious to get to know the person behind the screen. So I hope to um, serve you guys well in asking the the, the good and uh, juicy questions. Oh, so welcome, nervous. Lily. <laughs> Thank you, Cass. Wow. What a flattering introduction. I, I am so honored. It's, I had a blast with Cass. If you guys haven't checked out, what was it? Like, I think it was episode 11. Yeah, it was It was uh, two engineers who quit Google to work on climate. You guys should definitely check out that episode where I interviewed Cass. And uh, she was an amazing guest. And she definitely spilled some juicy stories. So. The, the interviewer wins by getting the other person to spill, spill more juice. <laughs> All right. Pressure is on. Yeah. So, well, maybe Lily, you can share some of your tips. Like what, what are the qualities of a good interviewer and a good guest? All right. Wow. Uh, starting off with a big question. What makes a good interviewer? Um, so I can't speak for everyone, but my interviewing style is I, I see each person as a book in the sense that I think everyone has a story and I try to highlight my guest story as much as possible and try to differentiate each guest from all the other guests I've featured on the show. So I think it's really important as an interviewer to gauge your guest and also your audience and then be able, be able to cater the storytelling to highlight and bring out the best part of your guest. And, and yeah. Oh, well, that's lovely. I, I see you like polishing each of us and making us. Yeah, because like, this is, so this is like how I do each episode, right? So every time I brought on a guest, I picture that guest as the protagonist of a novel. So then I think oh. about what, yeah, like, like, what should this novel be called? What would be the title? What would be the theme? What would be the story plot? Like, what would be the takeaway lessons, right? Like, so, so in that episode, you and Eugene, you guys were the hero and, and heroine. So I try to like emphasize your story and then like the key takeaways. It's almost as if by the end of this episode, the listener should have a grasp of, you know, have a grasp of your life and then like the lessons you've learned along the way and then really go through that journey with you vicariously. Uh, wow. So reading that novel. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. And how, how does one be a good guest then? 
Ooh, that, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a really good question. I, there's so many thoughts. I don't, I don't want to offend people. Okay. I would say try to be concise in your answer, but knowing what important details to leave in and then which details to leave out and to gauge which parts are relevant to the conversation and which parts are irrelevant. And I feel like a lot of guests struggle with that because for a lot of them, it's their first yeah. time being on a podcast. So they think a podcast is as easy as like hit record and talk. <laughs> it's not that easy. You have to have some sort of structure when you're speaking you have to think about what is the key message I am conveying and really like center your answer around that. I would say. Mm. And actually I want to go back to, I want to go back to something you said earlier where sure. you're viewing each guest as the protagonist and mm -hmm. the, the hero of the story. Um, is that how you view your life? Yes. Are you a professional interviewer? <laughs> Why do I feel like you should be the podcast host of Make Peace on Beef? I should just quit my job now and the listeners be like, yeah, yeah, we don't want Lily on here anymore. Like bring Cass back for future episodes. <laughs> and personally, really, I, I guarantee no one is saying that right now. Nobody. This woman's trying to steal my job. Oh my gosh, she's killing it. <laughs> you know, the interesting thing is no one has ever asked me that question before except for myself. So I've... <sighs> actually ask myself that that uh, like that's the only time i don't even think anyone else has ever thought of that analogy and absolutely 1000 percent uh i know it sounds like very egotistical but i do see myself as the protagonist of my world and you should see yourself as the protagonist of your world you know like i am a supporting character in your life cast but in my world like i do see it and a lot of people ask me like oh what do you want to get out of this life so i i've you know from a very young age i've always viewed my life as like a novel like if someone else was reading me and like this was a book that they were reading and the book is called lily or whatever my life journey is called what are the the lessons like i want them to take away from the story right and like there are days where I'm like feeling unproductive in my life or I'm not doing anything. And then I just think about like this hypothetical audience that's reading the book. It's like, Oh my God, it's been like five chapters and like there's zero <laughs> self-development. Come on, let's speed up on the plot. It's getting boring. <laughs> and that's kind of how I push myself to like achieve more. Wow. <laughs> more things. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Thank you for, for sharing. Cause like, I mean, really, I've known you for a few months and you're just so energetic. It, like you're doing so many things. Oh my like, God. Thanks. Like, Thank you. Podcast. <laughs> you're like bursting with energy. Like you're so bubbly. Like you're like never angry. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, Thank but I've you. always literally been so impressed with like the amount of agency that you 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 hold and like the like the Aww. yeah, I guess like the the power in, in your hands. It's, it's so <laughs> it's so impressive and it, it is very infectious. And so you're thank so you for sweet. sharing sharing that with us. I, I, I need Thanks. to try that. And in keeping with tradition of uh, <laughs> make peas, not beef. Um, Lily, what is your favorite plant-based vegan dish? Oh, so are we talking about desserts or like a savory dish? Because I've Ooh. got one for each category. <laughs> <laughs> okay, get, hit us with both. <laughs> let's make this a full course meal. Okay, let's start with the appetizer. Okay, what's my favorite vegan appetizer? Oh, definitely like buffalo cauliflower, like those crispy cauliflowers, like soaked in like buffalo sauce. And like fry to perfection. Yeah. 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 I'm seeing it. It's coming through. It's, it's manifesting. <laughs> it's manifesting. It's coming to my mouth. <laughs> okay. This is not a vegan dish. It's just a dish, but you can veganize it. It's pad thai. I love pad thai. Um, I also love dumplings. Just like veganize it. <laughs> okay. Okay. And for honestly, it's not even a vegan dish. It's just like my favorite dish. <laughs> Sorry. I failed. Yeah, I, I'm the same at like the, at the Thai restaurant. I'm like looking, I always look through the whole menu and I always order like, either pad thai or pet oh, right? but... I know it's amazing <laughs> can't go wrong can't go wrong <laughs> and for dessert Lily will be having oh yes oh my gosh okay now I have to give you my like top two because <laughs> I'm sorry I'm really bad at answering this question like you asked for one dish I gave you like five <laughs> Uh, my homemade vegan cheesecake. So I make it from cashews. So I basically like soak the cashews overnight. And next day I put it into a blender and then it blends into this creamy texture and that becomes the base of the cake. And then I make like uh, a homemade blueberry sauce. Okay, well, I'll be visiting you. And yes, <laughs> yes. Or when I, when I move to the States, like hopefully next year. Oh, heck yeah. I didn't know about that. Yeah, that's amazing. Like, well, because I'm going to Harvard, right? <laughs> You're going to do it. Okay, okay. I thought it was going to be a, okay. Oh. It was a real deferral rather than like a, okay. So you decided. We'll talk yeah, about it. Yeah, it was a real deferral. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've decided to go for sure. For Amazing. sure. So I'll okay. be coming to visit you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Just happen. Feel free to cut this out, Lily. But <laughs> but to all the um, single gentlemen uh, listening, <laughs> now you know what to um, 
take Lily out to on your, on your first date. <gasps> like it's pad thai. <laughs> oh yes. And the vegan cheesecake. That part is important. <laughs> yeah. Don't forget the cheesecake. <laughs> but it better, but it better taste better than the ones that I make or else I'd rather make it at home. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So Lily, like, I, I don't know if you covered this in any of your episodes before, but like, who are you? <laughs> what city did you come from? Where did you grow up? And what? What's with all these deep you? questions? I'm like, <laughs> well, it is I'm the first date, so. <laughs> first question is like, hi, what's your favorite dish? Second question is like, who are you? I'm like, <laughs> here's into my soul. <laughs> this is, yeah. I mean, on job interviews, this is the question that always gets me like, tell me about yourself. And like, like oh, damn. Yeah. I used to yes. be like, uh, uh, uh. And then I, know. Like, now like, I just uh, rattle a script. Uh, uh, I am just. <laughs> Uh, you know, like I, I'm, yeah, I am a collection of atoms <laughs> moving together. Uh, no, hi, listeners. For those of you who don't know, even after, even though I've already produced 21 episodes about, myself, <laughs> I am your host, Lily. And who am I? That that's a really good question. I am a climate creative. That's the term that I coined for myself which means I use my creativity to, to solve climate change. I educate the public on climate change and then also hoping to drive climate action with what I do with my podcast. So yes, I'm also a podcaster. Um, professionally, I am a software engineer right now. Um, and <laughs> I guess that sums up like my professional and then like uh, ambitions and goals. And then aside from that, uh, I haven't revealed this on my podcast yet, but I am, I recently became a, um, a devout disciple of spirituality. So uh, I do, I do practice daily to strengthen my connection with the universe. Um, but I, we'll, we'll get into that in, in future episodes. So uh, for all my friends and family who are watching this, you probably know me as someone who's like very vocal and passionate about climate action. <laughs> and the, the reason why Cass is here is because we share that passion, of course. And, you know, she is she's doing greater things than I am <laughs> when it comes to finding climate change as opposed to like producing useless comedy skits. <laughs> she's like actually, you know, trying to get grants and like trying to set up an organization, <laughs> which I really, really admire her for. I think that that basically sums up who I am. If you ask my friends who I am, they might say like, oh, Lily's a great like therapist, source of inspiration. <laughs> um, if you ask my parents, they'll probably say like, they'll probably say Lily's my daughter who got into Harvard. Apparently that part <laughs> matters to them. <laughs> Um, if you ask me, I am just an individual constantly seeking self-improvement and trying to really make the world a better place by the time I leave this planet than when I came into it. And that's it. <laughs> that's so beautiful. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> Did I yeah. answer that question well? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a very reductionistic question. So it's, it's like you answered it super gracefully. Like you the- came at me hard with these philosophical <laughs> questions, man. Like it's going to take me a decade to figure out the answer. <laughs> <laughs> and then because you got me to say such ridiculous things on my episode <laughs> that I'm I've sorry. actually been too embarrassed to even watch that episode. Like I, I, I are you kidding me? Longer. I watch it every yeah. day. Like it's <laughs> really great. <laughs> I'm curious, Lily. Like, do you have any hobbies, interests, hidden talents that would cause shock value? Oh, not anything in comparison to yours, Cass. <laughs> I am definitely nowhere near the BDSM community. <laughs> <laughs> neither am I. Neither am I. For those <laughs> yeah, guys, just go watch episode 11. You know, refresh your memory. <laughs> so. My hidden talents, a hobby. So I don't know if this is a hobby or I'm just being weird. But ever since I was a kid, I would, I would talk to myself. So I've been a, th- I've been my own therapist for like the past ten years. It's funny how like mental health is emerging as a really popular topic now. But I'm like, did you know that back when I was twelve, I was like talking to myself, <laughs> like I was healing myself from a young age. I used to like. I would, I would record an audio clip of talking to myself, like giving myself a pep talk or or life advice. And then like during hard times, I would like replay it and just like listen to it. And it would instantly make me feel better. (laughs) Wow. And I think because of that, like, that's what I did when I was younger. And then as I got older, I no longer felt the need to vocalize it. Cause I just like, there's that deeper inner knowing. So I'm able to sort of guide myself through difficult times. So I never really had to rely on external therapists. In fact, I tried a therapist once. It did not work. I, I still think I'm the better therapist of the two. <laughs> wow. That is fascinating. Like even at such a young age, you were kind of in control of your own destiny and in control of your own mind. 
right? I am, I am a creator. <laughs> I am a co-creator of my reality. <laughs> oh, whoa. Taking notes, taking notes. <laughs> hey, you wanted to get deep answers. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> this is amazing. Um, well, okay. So another theme that has been uh, like that I've noticed that in, in a lot of your answers is, is the theme of, of storytelling and uh, creation. And- of course, power of storytelling. That's a great question. So if you think about it, Every great politician, businessman, artist, scientist, anyone who has ever made a significant impact on humanity knows how to harness the the power of storytelling, whether it's through presentations, seminars, books that they've written, public rallies, et cetera, et cetera, right? I think powerful storytelling, when it's done right, it serves as a vicarious spiritual growth. It's like you didn't have to go through something or experience it yourself, but because But by hearing someone else's story, it felt as if that has already happened to you and you learned all the lessons and picked up all the gems along the way. So it's like the best part of storytelling is like not having to go through all that crap, but then still be able to like reap the benefits of it, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So like I said, it's it's a vicarious spiritual journey. Yeah. And how can your listeners like harness this power for themselves? (sighs) You cried by listening to my podcast and listen really carefully <laughs> to each and every episode, especially episode 11, <laughs> where you get to hear like Kat's story. Subscribe. <laughs> definitely, definitely hit the subscribe button. Also like, you know, just like slap in everybody's face that you run into be like, Hey, go listen to make these not be, but don't forget to leave me a five-star rating on Apple podcast. <laughs> That's how you can harness the power of storytelling. <laughs> I'm kidding. So here's the thing. Um, I think each human being is drawn to certain stories and not other ones. And I think we're all like, like for you, a story might resonate with you, but it might not resonate with me. Right. And I think we are drawn to the stories that we hear in our life for a reason, because it's there to teach you a lesson or because it resonates with you on some deep level. That's why you found that story valuable. So this is the part where I get a little bit spiritual, but, um, Like I see everything in the universe as being connected because I am made of stardust. You are made of stardust, right? The thing that make up this tree, this house, this planet, you and me, um, it's all the same. It's all atoms. It's all energy and vibration. So when I hear someone else's story, it's it's as if I I could go through that myself in a different lifetime or uh, at a different point in time. So I feel these stories is connected, like, because I see a part of myself in that person and a part of them in me. So um, really trying to empathize with that person and then really put yourself in their shoes. Like, okay, if I went through that circumstance or a similar story, how can their story apply to my circumstance and use the same mm-hmm. like mentality? I'll like, use that as a tool to mm-hmm. help you overcome whatever difficulties you're going through or like help you achieve success. Yeah. So what are some of your favorite stories that have inspired you? Sorry, I don't think I answered that question properly. How to harness this, the, the power story. Did you mean like how to tell better stories or how to like... Uh, get more out of other people's stories, right? I think that's the part I was confused. Yeah, I I guess when you hear a story um, like that does touch you in some way, like what what usually happens and like, what do you do? Like what what does that kick off for you afterwards? Oh, yes, yes. So uh, two things, either it like one, it inspires some action on my behalf. So, so, So like if I hear someone else tell a story that's really inspiring and then I try to think, oh, but that story also applies to this aspect of my life. Like with my podcast, I can apply the same things and I can like use it to grow my podcast, my impact and things like that. So then I apply certain aspects of their story to my own life. So I take inspired action. Number two, I reach out that person and say, thank you for your story because mm-hmm. that has really inspired me to, to take action. Right. And then number three, I share that story with the ones around me to empower wow. more people. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I think that's a better answer. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. Like, cause yeah. So I, I love how it, the, um, the energy flows both ways. Like you receive some energy from that story and then you reach back um, Absolutely. To, to the storyteller in case that, in case they're open to some sort of connection. Cause they want to hear that their stories empower other people too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's so lovely. That's that. Yeah. That, that's yeah. Up so many ideas in my, in my head. <laughs> and actually like one idea that I thought was mm-hmm. really interesting, um, like is the idea of how bacteria um, share intelligence with each other. So bacteria- So scientifically minded. (laughs) (laughs) They generate these little like uh, little rings called plasmids, like little rings of DNA or RNA, and then they secrete them into the environment. And then another bacteria might go and absorb that and incorporate it. And then they, they um, generate like, uh, like antibiotic resistance or something. (laughs) But but the point is they're, they're like, disseminating this knowledge between each other. And, um, I mean, like humans do this too, through like 
um, I don't know, like writing or texting or tweeting and, and various forms, but it just feels as though like our brains are wired for stories and our, our, our brains are wired to share knowledge through, through stories. It just like stories really move people. Like, like I, um, like being, being like scientifically minded myself, I'm, I'm just like frustrated that statistics and like logic and reason don't move people. Like it's Absolutely. the story that move people. Um, but now I'm kind of leaning into it. So I'm actually trying to gather some stories in which um, other people have succeeded in very efficient activism. So there was some low hanging fruit um, and like, yeah, there, there was some low hanging fruit and like, uh, I, I don't know, I just, I don't want to take it to the asthmatic children. The one that you told me, that was a really great story. I still remember to this day. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. It's powerful. And uh, you made a really great analogy with bacteria, by the way, it's funny how, when you said, Oh, this reminded me of the story. I thought you were going to talk about human beings. And then you went straight into bacteria. I'm like, <laughs> Don't pass. <laughs> I admire the story for, of bacteria <laughs> and how efficiently they're able to transfer their knowledge. Like imagine if we could just like beam you a thought. Um, yeah, absolutely. And Elon Musk yeah. is working on that with Neuralink. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so Lily, like what are, what are some of your favorite stories that have inspired you? Like what are stories that have shaped you into who you are? Ooh. That's a really great question. So stories that have inspired me. I feel like every one of my guests that I've featured on my podcast inspired me on some level where else I wouldn't cover their story and also cast your story of, you know, leaving Google with Eugene and you guys go working on climate and making that your life mission. That really, really, really inspires me. You have no idea because like before meeting you and I'm finding coming across work on climate. Once again, this is turning into a work on climate PR. Like just, I, I don't even intentionally do it. Every episode, it just comes up because I truly, truly believe in the mission of what you guys are doing. I felt alone. I felt like I was the only person who cared about climate change, um, at least in my immediate surrounding. But then after joining this organization and feel like meeting thousands of other people who are working on it, it really gives me hope. So I want you to know that your organization has oh. tremendous value and truly, truly, like, I feel like I feel 10 times more motivated to work on climate because knowing there are thousands of others doing the same. Wow. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, so some stories that shaped me. Uh, so I would say the, the single story or the single person that shaped me the most is definitely my mother. Um, so you're going to hear throughout my podcast that, that my mom is a centerpiece in my life and she really helped shape who I am, you know, and because like, she's this like really creative and progressive woman and, like she was born in China during the 1960s. That's like during the, the cultural revolution, right? It's like communist China, term and male. And she was born during a time where, you know, um, there was not a lot of female empowerment. And, and I think, I actually think my mom is like one of the forerunners in like feminist philosophy in China, like with, with what she's doing today as well. I think she is like, looking back, I think she is a very effective activist, even though she never called herself that, like her entire life mission has to has been empowering women and, you know, educating women and teaching women to be more independent, you know, financially, emotionally, and really um, telling these women to, to take the power back and really take ownership of their life. And, and the great thing about my mom is that um, throughout her life and, and looking at her life story, she doesn't believe in lecturing her kids, but she believes that the best way to parent is by doing, it's by exemplifying the person that you want your kids to become. So, you know, my mom was the one who, who took me abroad to Canada, like, of course, she didn't have a divorce with my dad. They're still happily married. But uh, she made a lot of decisions looking back that I feel like a lot of women would have never, ever dared to do. And because of her and all the opportunities she's given me, she allowed me to have the life that I have today. So my mom's story is one of, I would say, like perseverance, entrepreneurship, um, and just someone who really roams free with her creativity and because of that, I feel like I inherited a lot of her like free spiritedness. And then like also just her, her drive to create and not be afraid to express who she is as a person. So what about, what about you, Cass? Like, okay, reverse question time. What's a story that really inspires you or, or has shaped who you are? I, I guess it is the activism stories and that's why I am, I'm collecting them. So I guess mm. the, the story that kicked off this search for activism stories. Um, so I was in, um, grad school at the MIT Media Lab and um, an activist came in to give a talk. And the story he told blew my mind, which was a um, canonical picture of Rosa Parks sitting on a bus yes. in front of a white man. Like um, that was actually a, a staged shot. Like the, mm -hmm. uh, the man is a, 
was a photographer and this was taken the next day um, after that happened. And that um, uh, like, this was a carefully created visual, like not, not, not to like, it, like to make it mimetic in our minds to help the story spread. Like it's a true story and that like there really is, uh, there really was like bus seg- segregation and discrimination uh, there. But um, the the story of, of Rosa Parks was also um, like designed by activists. I um, like, I, I, this was so unbelievable to me because I never heard about this growing up in school that I actually went down a little YouTube Wait. or it, internet rabbit hole. Uh, I, I believe that there was a search for someone to go do this intentionally, like not give up their seat on a bus and see what would happen. Um, and, and so Rosa Parks was chosen for, for that. Yeah. So you're saying the whole thing is scripted. Uh, well, I mean like the environment is real and wish it happened, but um, in terms of. So Rosa Parks knew what she was doing. Like someone told her like, Hey, I want you to, to do this and see what would happen. That that's what it seems to be. Like actually, I, sh- I should double check that because before this like gets disseminated uh, broadly, like, yeah, like the N- NAACP like went out and scouted people um, to do this, and uh, like Rosa Parks was like uh, like had no background that the media could smear in in a bad way. And- Whoa, okay, because how I heard the story was like it just it just happened. It was not. I didn't know there was intention behind. It. Wow, I definitely learned something new. I thought she was just like a, like a courageous woman, you know, who stood up, who, who stood her ground. Like that's how Rosa Parks was supposed to remember. I never knew she. Well, she was courageous for doing that. Yes. Uh, absolutely. Because like there, there are really real consequences. And wow. yeah, and that, that blew my mind too. Cause like, yeah, like when I heard the story, it was. That is crazy. Was, yeah, in the moment she was tired, getting off work. Um, like that, that was the story that we were hurt. We were told in school, but um, the activist was saying like, no, this is like these are designed stories and designed images. Um, and that is how social movements take place. You just, oh my gosh, you just blew my mind because what you've just said is basically like, don't leave your activism up to chance. Start consciously designing situations that allow activism to happen, to inspire conversations, to start a movement. And like that blew my mind because now I want to be a creative director for activism. <laughs> <laughs> like wow like imagine what we could do with climate change if we design things but then would people be like oh but you guys are like would they then see it as a hoax because it's designed by someone who would say like everything is staged and it's not real that that's interesting that's something i wrestle with too so which is hard for me to like like tell like the rosa park story even though i think it is so empowering i take it like in such a positive way yeah like, i think it's amazing they should yeah mainstream corporates like they totally design opposite stories and opposite marketing and opposite- exactly exactly yeah. we should counter like, that shit like it, 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 yeah so uh, we have to win by by like yes, really yes. And, and like taking the like control back of our um mind space yes I, I agree with you on this because corporations spent billions of dollars on marketing and storytelling alone and that's how and, and they like deliberately create these false narratives to advance the, their profits and whatever right so i think you're right as activism we should tell the reverse story and you know it might sound a little bit controversial like because there are people who are like oh but like it's not like you guys are deliberately crafting these narratives but who's to say that like you said like corporations aren't or politicians aren't yeah. And it's not to say that we should like, stoop to their level. It's just no. to say like it is happening and you may not be aware of it. So I am learning so much. I might need to like rename this episode to like the power of storytelling and activism <laughs> instead of like reverse interview. <laughs> no, but no, this is just kind of like the weird rabbit hole of environmentalism that I went down under. Like, uh, but Lily, like you are. I a- love it. Yeah, no, really, I love like, it. Environmentalism is a recurring theme um, in your work and writing. Um, like, can you, I mean, I obviously care, but can you share with our viewers, like, like, why do you personally care? Yeah, of course. Oh my gosh. So like, Cass, like w- when I discovered you, I really felt like you were like my sister, you know, from another <laughs> mother in, in the sense that like, cause you called yourself a climate activist and that's what I've been calling myself for many years long before I met you. And the funny thing is when I was, when I was younger, like when I was like five or six, yeah, I, I definitely identified it as an environmentalist. But then as I got older, I was like, guys, it's no longer about preserving the environment. It's about like fighting a crisis that we've gotten ourselves in. So I started calling myself a climate activist because it's no longer like, oh, we're trying to save the trees or protect this park, right? It's like our future is in question right now. 
Um, so, and I think my environmentalism naturally evolved into climate activism over the years as you know, climate change and global warming got worse. But I think how it first started, and I explained this on a previous episode as well, is I was born and raised in Beijing in China. And as you can probably, <laughs> as you probably know, Beijing is one of the most heavily polluted cities in China, especially back in the days. There was a lot of smog and you know, cases of sandstorms, um, also water scarcity. Uh, air pollution problems, traffic congestion, and all, all these problems. So I kind of grew up in an environment where I witnessed environmental degradation firsthand. And the funny thing is, actually, China was very good with these, like, uh, save water, save, you know, like, like, don't pollute the environment. Like, they were really good with these campaigns. And growing up, like, I saw these signs in schools and public spaces everywhere, like, save water, like, uh, like, uh, you know, protect the, like, protect the trees, protect the flower. And so, uh, the funny thing is, yeah, there were actually like, I think the Chinese government was very heavy on that, like a lot more so compared to Canada, because when I immigrated here, I realized how wasteful people are with like food and resources and everything. Whereas I think back in Asia in general, because of resource scarcity and population density, people are more mindful of their consumption. Of course, this is pre-capitalist China. And then after you like after China entered into a mixed economy, you start to see like with urbanization, people started to become more wasteful and materialistic. And that's a topic for another day. And then I that's that's when it really hit me like, wow, I feel like I feel this shift in our mentality and like not in a good way. Like that's when I that's when it first hit me, the dangers of a developing nation headed for a developed nation, because that means they're going to follow the same path and the same consumerist behaviors that's going to lead to climate change. Right. And that's what I had feared the most with economic development in China, that they're going to follow the same path as America. And, you know, which is eventually going to lead to obesity, climate change and all these other issues. So I just really became aware of all these urban issues, environments at the center of, of it all. Um, and I think climate change is an issue I follow very closely. In grade eight, um, my science teacher showed me the inconvenient truth. And I remember all the other kids in my like class didn't even pay attention to it. But like the first time I watched it and you know, Al Gore talking about it and that that scene of a polar bear drifting on ice just never, ever left me. And over the years, I think I tried to lie to myself about what I wanted to do for a career and things like that. Like when I was in high school, I was like, oh, I want to become the minister of the environment one day. <laughs> and then that like went down the drain. And then I studied software engineering. But uh, I, this is the interesting thing I want to tell listeners, which is that I think the universe always has a way of putting you back on your path. And for me, it was reconnecting with my environmentalist roots. And when I was like 23, 24, 25, this, this voice started like <laughs> brewing, like festering at the back of my head is like, oh, but I think you're meant to do this. Like, I don't think you're meant to be stuck in a corporate job. I think you're, I think you're meant to create social impact just to help solve climate change, because that's an issue that's been central to your life, uh, you know, this entire time. So, and over the years, that voice got louder and louder. And the more books that I read, um, and then it just became clear to me, like, yeah, it's climate change a crisis. And so in 2018, when I decided to apply for Harvard to go to grad school, I, I think something in me just clicked. It's like, that's it. I want to, I no longer want life to passively happen to me. Like, I know I can live comfortably and, and make a living for myself as a software engineer, but I just knew, like, that's not my life purpose and that's not my life mission. And now I no longer want to passively live life. I want to consciously create my reality and I choose to be a climate activist and I choose to make that my career, my life mission. And the other thing with me is, like, I've always viewed myself as a creative. So, so for the longest time, um, it was really hard to like wrestle the two because I was like, oh, but I, I want to be an artist. I want to be a creative. But then it's also like, oh, but I want to tackle climate change. So I saw those two as disparate things I had to choose between. And then in recent years, I was like, why can't I be both? Why can't I be an artistic director and also help solve climate change? Why can't I be a creative uh, with a social purpose or a mission, right? So now I think I'm really like finally taking ownership of my life and reconciling with myself and being honest with myself about what I want to do and what fulfills me. And that's what that's why I decided to start this podcast. And in the future, I hope to be a keynote speaker. Like I've already visualized myself one day speaking in front of thousands of people um, about climate change and, and the work that I am doing. I have no doubt it's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. So, yeah. Wow, Lily. I, I, I got chilled. <laughs> I got to wait there. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, thanks. <That> cool. <laughs> Thank well, you. I get to interview you first. So, <laughs> that's such an honor. You got chills. I almost ran out of breath. <laughs> that was amazing. Wow. Like, the 
I'm, I'm re-inspired, honestly. Like, I mean, because like activism is like, like tough stuff. And like, you're, like it's, it's, hard. it's hard being outside of a corporate world too. It's like really like, <laughs> it's like without like a umbrella over your head and the like, yeah. sun's beating down. And so, yeah, I'm totally going through like, like ups and downs as well. And like, just hearing you share Aww. that and like, to hear like the conviction in your voice is really like, <laughs> oh, you make me want to cry now. <laughs> and, and Cass, you, you inspire me so much with the work that you do as well. So please, mm-hmm. like I derive a lot of inspiration by looking at what you are doing. And every time like I see someone else working on it as well, like that gives me motivation to keep doing what I'm doing. Cause I feel like we're part of a larger coalition. Wow. <laughs> yeah and, and come come join us in working on working on climate at work yeah on of course we ever need that third co-founder <laughs> let me maybe know. the yeah call out to to the universe <laughs> yes yes but, join us. but lily you, you touched on it a little bit but um can you share like what's next for you like i i heard harvard and that's very exciting yes and, um, so. yeah, you, what is that gonna be like <laughs> Oh my God, how many years? I'm losing track of time because of quarantine. I think it was 2019. Yeah, so in the fall of 2019, I think right when Greta Thunberg was protesting and she started this worldwide uh, climate strike, right? Around that time, I had already started on uh, my uh, Harvard Kennedy School application and I wrote this like really heartfelt <laughs> application essay uh, talking about how I wanted to solve climate change and all of that. And the funny thing was March, 2020, uh, when the pandemic first hit, I actually got my ad- admission letter and I, was told that I was admitted. And so I was really excited to go to grad school, but then also looking at the looming pandemic, um, I was like, oh shit, like it's, it's going to be on campus or virtual for the, for the upcoming semester. And then Harvard confirmed that it's going to be virtual. So, and then they gave me a choice. They're like, okay, either you take this two year deferral, two year deferral, not one year, or um, you can attend in the fall, but it's going to be virtual. And I had no doubt in my mind that I was going to, it was very hard, but I chose the two year deferral. And then I was like, fuck, well, so I had already told my boss, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to go work on climate change. I was excited. And then now I'm like, okay, wait, wait, wait. I need my job back. I need to pay rent. <laughs> so then like, it's funny. Like I already submitted my resignation letter and all the VP were like, wow, we're really happy for you, Lily. Like, good for you. Go do your thing. And then I was like, actually, <laughs> can I have my job back? I'm sorry. <laughs> so I'm sure there were like, they were really happy to have you for an extra few years. <laughs> yes, for sure. Right. Like, yeah. And I'm really, really grateful for Vice, like really grateful uh, for my boss who understood my situation and welcome me back. I mean, don't get me wrong. I do like working with my team. If my boss is ever watching this video, like I, I, I do enjoy the work I do, but um, unfortunately I, I can't lie to myself. Right. Like I already told them, I made it very clear to them that like, it's my life mission to solve climate change and nothing's going to change my mind about that. <laughs> so I took the two year deferral that, which means hopefully um, next year from so a year from now 2022 fall i will be in cambridge in boston so guys come hang out with me and uh, show me some vegan restaurants nearby <laughs> we can <Ooh>. chill <laughs> <laughs> so lily like um that that's such a beautiful vision like what is like maybe we can close with like what is your wish for the world and how do you see us collectively achieving it what's my vision for the world um i have three um, number one, I would love for the world to go vegan. <laughs> so, um, so I am a vegan for those of you who didn't know, I am a vegan for uh, all the reasons you can think of, obviously for environmental reasons, obviously for like, um, animals, um, because like for ethical reasons, right. And then I'm a vegan for health reasons. I think the world, if the world went vegan and I have no doubt that plant-based is the future. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure like in 50 years from now, we're going to look back at animal agriculture and we're going to be like, wow, like that was, that was like another Holocaust. How do we not see that all along? So the first thing is to make the world go vegan. I really believe in that. Um, like I said, for ethical health and environmental reasons. And then the second thing is I would love for the world to <laughs> work on climate, of course. <laughs> um, so here's the thing, uh, Cass, like, I feel like my philosophy on climate change probably differs from a lot of other environmentalists, especially a lot of people who are in our organization, because like, I know for Eugene, he personally said this, you know, he said like, we don't need to like stop eating meat in order to solve climate change. But for me, I see it as like, 
I think climate change is a symptom of the problem. Like my previous guest has said this too, Nivi. It's a symptom of the problem. It's not the problem itself. So you can come up with the best carbon removal technologies in the world. But if you don't remodel our economic system and rehabilitate our relationship with nature, this problem is going to come back. It's going to take on a different form and possibly worse next time around. So I feel like if you don't eradicate the root of the problem, which is that our economy is centered around this extractive, exploitative model. We exploit the planet for its resources. We exploit animals, their bodies for food and um, pleasure. Like I just think it's so wrong that humans are playing God and we're overstepping our boundaries. And maybe this is getting more into spirituality, but the reason why, like, I feel like ever since I became a vegan, my environmentalism has taken on, like, it, it, I took it to the next level. Like before I was an environmentalist, I was concerned about the environment and I tried to like eat less meat and travel less. But then as I became a vegan, I felt like my consciousness was elevated and I start to see the world from a different angle. You know, like I'm still an environmentalist. I'm still from an emission, but I, re, I started to see the, how all of these problems are connected, social inequality, climate change, animal cruelty, and like all these problems exist because humans are so greedy and we're so selfish and we think we are the superior species and we think we can play God and mess with nature and look at where we have left nature. Like we've left it in a really bad state with where the oceans is with the forest being burned down. Like, I feel like if we don't learn our lesson now and, and really treat the root of the problem, it's not just about like, I think carbon removal is a, is a great technology. Don't get me wrong. We do need to invest time and energy into doing that because we need it at this point in order to stop climate change. But as a transitional technology, once we get past that, how can we redesign our entire framework and and economies such that we can exist um, in harmony with our ecosystem and the broader uh, planet around us and be being really mindful that we are one of many species on this planet? Um, so I think, you know, like there's two schools of thoughts, right? Uh, I think in the environmentalist world, one is like very tech driven, like we're going to remove all this carbon and then, then problems will be solved. We'll take CO2 out of the atmosphere and the planet will cool down and great. We can continue on with life as it is. And the second school of thought is what I propose is like, well, wait a second, let's take climate change as an opportunity to really assess like the world that we have designed as it is today. Is it a flawed system? Did we make some fundamental uh, mistakes when we designed it? Because when, when boomers, the previous generation designed the world as we know it, right? They focused on achieving convenience, making like human civilization more advanced with technology. We had phones, cars, like, yes, that added value to our life and it made it more convenient, but they did not have sustainability in mind. And that's what got us to the state that we are in today. So I think we can leverage climate change as an opportunity to really wake up to, to this much broader crisis, which requires, I think, a lot of times a, a lift in our consciousness to really understand the problem. It's not just that there's too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That is a symptom of the problem. The bigger problem is our greed and, and how we've abused nature, I think, for wow. our own good. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I, I really see that. Like you definitely shifted me from like the, the, the <laughs> you were the, 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 yeah, like it is. Yeah, you're right. It is, it is a symptom. Like, like we're a little short-sighted, like it <laughs> like, the dark side, is, we have requires things. some like philosophical, like reworking, like, like, yeah, philosophical, spiritual reworking. I mean, think um, about it. Think about it. Like, because this is where I see Silicon Valley's head, right? Like for the next hundred years, they're going to start investing, pouring billions and billions of dollars into climate tech. It's kind of like the dot-com boom. Like, you know, back in 2000, they had like all these like PayPal and all these companies. And in the next 10 years, they're going to focus on like renewable tech, energy tech, climate tech, all of this, which I think is great. You know, I, and, but, um, which is why I feel like Beyond Meat has a fundamentally different mission from all the other companies. Like I, I do think Ethan Brown, he's very entrepreneurial minded, but, um, I think any company that is working on meat alternatives sees the larger problem because the moment you become vegan, you're no longer just like, how can I phrase it? Like the moment I became vegan, it was no longer just about I'm vegan because, oh, I want to reduce carbon emissions. It's because I see that all these problems are connected, like climate change, like I said, animal agriculture, animal cruelty, slavery, inequality. All of these problems are really the same, which is that humans are a hierarchical species. And we need to establish the hierarchy between men and women, you know, between different races, between human and, and animals, right? And 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 climate change is a is a physical manifestation. Yeah, they're all exploitative. Like 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 yes. what like what group of things or people? Or, Who should we prioritize? Yeah. Who should yeah. suffer? Exactly. So if you think about it, ten years, twenty years from now, like why do you think Elon Musk is is working on like SpaceX? I thought about this, right? Like 
I think he's very noble. He's very smart, but there are days where I question his motive. And I think, well, he's trying to build himself a spaceship because guess what? He's going to be the first one to flee from this planet when it's on fire. You know, it's going to be the billionaires that, that get to board that ship first. And all of us, we're going to be left behind. I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, I think he's doing great. Like, I think Elon Musk is still doing great work. He's like, look, let me try to save the planet first with Tesla. But if things don't work out, plan B, you know, <laughs> but and, and, and like, you know, because recently he started tweeting about like going to Mars and like, oh, like this is how we should colonize Mars. And it just makes me so sad because, you know, if you've ever seen my like work on climate profile photo, it's, it's like me with a little sad little earth with a little arrow that says my mom. Because I'm like, guys, but what about our mom? Like you're leaving her behind and you're now onto the next planet. You've, you've exploited her, you've raped her. And now you're onto the next planet. Like, I think there's something fundamentally wrong here. And I think we need to st- take a step back and really look at it. Like, I don't want to give up on the earth yet. As cliche yeah. as that sounds, I want to, I want to help. Like, I feel like earth is like, you know, like it's, it's like a cancer patient. Like I had this like analogy and like, we are the parasite of course, or like that's causing it. And, and like we're in stage four cancer or whatever, but I don't want to give up and I'm, I'm praying for a miracle to happen. And I want to help it happen. I don't want to just give up on, on this planet and go for some plan B. I want to fight to the last moment and do everything Mm -hmm. we can. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's super sad. Yeah. And like, honestly, like my personal opinion is like, if we can't get it working on earth, like there's no way we're going to get it working on yeah, Mars. Yeah, exactly. So hard. If on Mars, the same shit is going to happen so again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And like, do you ever... Is, this is easy mode. <laughs> like, do you ever feel like there's like stages in environmentalism? You know, like the first stage is like, oh, you're aware of the problem, like climate change. And the next stage is like, oh, we need to take climate action. These are different actions we can take. And then when you reach the ultimate stage, it's like, wait a second, we're not really tackling climate change. We're trying to change human nature. That's ultimately what we're trying to do. If you think about mm-hmm. it, because climate change will exist so long as we continue to be greedy and exploitative, right? hmm mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, it's basically all like a people problem. Yeah. So we're trying to change human nature, right? Like that's really, it's a human project right here. That's, that's mm-hmm. what it is. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And Lily, what is your third wish for the world? These first two wishes are so good. Oh, oh. my third wish is that I can have a hundred more wishes. <laughs> <laughs> and then every, every wish would be like a different climate action. Be like, oh, like, you know, I wish like we would completely be a hundred percent renewable powered and things like that. But <laughs> my third wish is, um, I really wish for the world to be more compassionate and less selfish. And really, I wish for each human being to, to be less self-absorbed and really understand your place in this world and, and yourself in relation to all the other people and the planet and the, and the other animals. Like, I wish that I can elevate each person's soul and their consciousness to the next level, because I think that's, that's what humanity needs right now. <laughs> yeah. um, and I think that's ultimately what's going to solve climate change. Sure, we can enforce these policies, but I think you have to first empower the people to to empower them to make the right decisions that are beneficial for their own health and the planet's health and the animal's health as well. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful, Lily. Thank you so much for being <laughs> on Make Peace Not Beef. Thank you for starting this podcast. And Thank you. I definitely feel elevated. Thank you for your message. This was like not what I was expecting coming in for for, wow. for this interview. This is like so much better. Like, thank you. <laughs> like I, I had hey, my just my spirit is talking through me. Like I said, I opened the channel and I'm like, yo, feed me, feed me. That was not not me that was that was my higher self talking that was that was really cool and if anyone's listening and like here with us then like, yeah like, re- reach out reach out to to lily I, I, like, this may be like a you uni- the universe might be setting um setting this up and for some good events to kick off so. oh thank you Cass. and yes please listener if you're listening and and now you understand my mission and you want to help me and and help me amplify my movement and, and help Cass, please reach out to us we'd love to get in touch with you because the sooner we can overcome this the better so like i said like you know at this point it, it's it's not just a project to save the earth it's a project to save humanity and to elevate our consciousness so many people are working on that <laughs> it's 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 a much bigger mission okay to close it well well not to close it off i shouldn't be the one to close it off you should be the one but i just i want to thank you Cass, for this opportunity and i think it's such a great idea that you've decided to interview me because if I had done a solo segment, I would have never been able to talk about these things because I would have never been able to think of those questions. And you asked me really great questions in this interview, and that's what triggered these responses. So I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> thank you. <For laughs> I don't know if I can follow. Wow. Um, like, yeah, I mean, I, I, I honestly knew, like, when you were interviewing me that, like, 
you were a fascinating person. <laughs> like, oh, like I was just getting vibes. Like Lily's a fascinating you? person. And there are so many things that I wanted to ask. So I'm so lucky that we got to spend like an hour together um, going through this and like more conversations to come. Mm-hmm.